So we're convened here to continue Philo of Alexandria's on creation. Um, very excited. I uh, just one thought before we jump into this that uh, popped into my mind as a reminder. Uh, people who've, who have read through Kepler are familiar with this um, method of um, of of situating the the quanti the the discoverable quantization of reality into a a domain of reason right and 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 kepler and all great scientists had a sense that there is a harmony that organizes systems whether living non-living whatever whatever you're looking at on the big galactic planetary uh molecular atomic there's a certain sense that there are certain harmonic symmetries, certain harmonic resonances in the audio or uh, visual domain of light or sound frequencies that are very much connected in a magnetic way. Um, the question is, is, are these resonances the way they are? Is the order the way it is because of number specifically? Um, is it that there's some magic in the numbers themselves and the quantities? Or is there some purpose um, built into the universe that expresses itself in certain proportions that we can then see as shadows as number and this dance between mathematics and physics has been going on for a long time and they obviously work together very importantly but which leads which follows is a point of big the the, the political ramifications of of positioning one or the other in the leadership position are huge so that's something to keep in mind as we read through more of Philo's works, because uh, he is intervening on the superstitious sort of um, over numerological mindset of the world that he's living in that allows people to fall into a uh, a pattern of thinking that will induce them to be swayed by sophistry um, and act in in ways that are unbecoming of a, of a dignified human being, to say the least. So, um, yeah, hold that in mind. And I'm going to do a little screen share as we start. I think it was at section or point 59 or 60 that we left off at. Any uh, any thoughts from last week's reading that anybody wants to share or just uh, are we all pretty good? Yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, it, the the text is in the uh, the description box of this video. And like usual, as we're... As we're uh, reading through this, feel free to stop, ask a question, share a thought. A lot of thoughts will be awoken, as uh, as is always the case with these great platonic thinkers. So um, I'll try to make the screen as big as I can or the words as big as I can. That's not working. Why is that not working? Do it that way. All right. Working so I think we now. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, Luke, do you want to read or uh, do you want to skip it for now? And, and... Me. Tell me if there's a problem with the audio. Um, Declan, what do you think? I think, honestly, I think the audio sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, okay. De I, I agree with Declan. I think you're, it might be a little, little quiet, but it's fine. It's totally, yeah. we can hear you pretty well. So we're starting at 59. Yeah, that's a good spot to start. We might have read that, but I, I think that's a, that's a fine spot. And then uh, we could switch it up. Okay. And before now, some men have conjecturally predicted disturbances and commotions in of the earth from the revolutions of the heavenly bodies and innumerable other events which have turned out most exactly true, so that it is most veracious saying that the stars were created to act as signs and moreover to act to mark the seasons. And by the word seasons, the divisions of the year are here intended. And why may not this be reasonably affirmed? For what other idea of opportunity can there be except that it is the time for success and the seasons bring everything to perfection and set everything right? 
giving perfection to the sowing and planting of fruits and to the birth and growth of animals. There were also created, uh, they were also created to serve as measure of time for it is by the appointed period, period, <laughs> periodical revolutions of the sun and moon and other stars that days and months and years are determined. And moreover, it is owing to them that the most useful of all things, the nature of number exists. Time having displayed it, for from one day comes the limit and from two, the number two, and from three, three, and from the notion of a month is derived the number 30. And from a year, that number, which is equal to the days of the 12 months. And from infinite time comes the notion of infinite number. To such great and indispensable advantages do the natures of the heavenly bodies and the motions of the stars tend and to how many other things might I also affirm that they contribute, which are as yet unknown to us. For all things are not known to the will of man, but of the things which contribute towards the durability of the universe, those which are established by laws and ordinances which God has appointed to be unalterable forever are accomplished in every instance and in every country. Then when earth and heaven had been adorned with their befitting ornaments, one with a triad and the other, as has been already said with a quaternion, God proceeded to create the races of mortal creatures making the beginning with the aquatic animals on the fifth day, thinking that there was no one thing so akin to another as the number five as to animals. For animate things differ from inanimate in nothing more than in sensation. And sensation is divided according to a fivefold division into sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. Accordingly, the Creator allotted to each of the senses its appropriate matter and also its peculiar faculty of judgment by which it should decide on what came before it. So sight judges of colors and hearing of sounds and taste of juices and smell of vapors and touch of softness and hardness and of heat and cold and of smoothness and roughness. Therefore, he commanded all the races of fish and sea monsters to stand together in their places, animals deferring, uh, deferring both in their sizes and in their qualities, for they vary in different seas, though in some cases they are the same, and every animal was not formed to live everywhere. And was not this reasonable? For some of them delight in marshy places and in a water which is very deep, and some in sewers and harbors, being neither able to crawl up upon the land, nor to swim off far from the land. So again, dwell in the middle and in the deep sea, and avoid all the projecting promontories and islands and rocks. Some also exult in fine weather and in calm, some in storms and heavy surf, for being exercised by continual buffetings and being in the habit of withstanding the current by force, <clears throat> they are very 
vigorous and become stout. After that, he created the races of birds as akin to the races of aquatic anim animals, for they are each of them swimmers, leaving no species of creatures which traverse the air unfinished. So now, when the air and the water had received their appropriate races of animals as an allotment that was their due, God again summoned the earth for the creation of that share which still remained. And after the production of plants, the terrestrial animals still remained. And God said, let the earth bring forth cattle and beasts and creeping things of each kind. And the earth did as it was commanded and immediately sent forth animals deferring in their formation and in their strength and in the injurious or beneficial powers that were implanted in them. And after all, he made man. But how he made him, I will mention presently, after I have first explained that he adopted the most beautiful connection and train of consequences according to the system of the creation of animals, which he had sketched out to himself. For of souls, the most sluggish and the most weakly formed has been allotted to the races of fishes, and the most exquisitely endowed soul, that which is in all respects most excellent, has been given to the race of mankind. And one something between the two, to the races of terrestrial animals and those which traverse the air. For the fowl of such creatures is endowed soul. with, oh, <laughs> with, for the soul of such creatures is endowed with more acute sensations than the soul of fishes, but is more dull than that of mankind. And it was on this account that of all living creatures, God created fishes first, inasmuch as they partake of corporeal substance in a greater degree than they partake of soul, being in a manner animals and not animals, moving soulless things, having a sort of semblance of soul diffused through them, for no object beyond that of keeping their bodies live. Just as they say that salt preserves meat, in order that they may not easily be destroyed. And after the fishes, he created winged and terrestrial animals, for these are endowed with a higher degree of sensation, and from their formation show that the properties of their animating principle are of a higher order. But after all the rest, then, as has been said before, he created man, to whom he gave that admirable endowment of mind, the soul, if I may so call it, of the soul as being like the pupil to the eye. For those who may, who most accurately investigate the, na the natures of things affirm that it is the pupil which is the eye of the eye. So at last all things were created and existing together. But when all were collected in one place, then some sort of order was necessarily laid down for them for the sake of the production of them from one another, which was hereafter to take place. Now, in things which exist in part, the principle of order is this, to begin with that which is most inferior in its nature, and to end with that which is the most excellent of all. And what that is, we will explain. It has been arranged that seed should be the principle of the generation of animals. It is plainly seen that this is a thing of no importance, being like foam. 
but when it has descended into the womb and remained there, then immediately it receives motion and is changed into nature. And nature is more excellent than seed, as also motion is better than quiet in created things. And nature, like a workman, or to speak more correctly, like a faultless art, endows the moist substance with life and fashions it, uh, fashions it distributing it among the limbs and parts of the body, allotting that portion which can produce breath and nourishment and sensation to the powers of the soul. For as to the reasoning powers, we may pass over them for the present on account of those who say that the mind enters into the body from without, being something divine and eternal. Nature therefore began from an ins insignificant seed and ended in the most honorable of things, namely, in the formation of animals and men. And the very same thing took place in the creation of everything. For when the Creator determined to make animals the first created in his arrangement were in some degree inferior, such as the fishes, and the last were the best, namely man. He's not a big fan of the fishes, huh? <laughs> and the hierarchy other, of evolution. <laughs> and the others, the terrestrial and winged creatures were between these extremes being better than the first created and inferior to the last. So then, after all the other things, as has been said before, Moses says that man was made in the image and the likeness of God. And he, he says, well, for nothing, and he says, well, for nothing that is born on the earth is more resembling God than man. And let no one think that he is able to judge of this likeness from the characters of the body. For neither is God a being with the form of a man, nor is the human body like the form of God. But the resemblance is spoken of with reference to the most important part of the soul, namely the mind. For the mind which exists in each individual has been created after the likeness of that one mind which is in the universe as its primitive model, being in some sort the God of that body which carries it about and bears its image within it. In the same rank that the great governor occupies in the universal world, that some as it seems, uh, that some, that same as it seems does the mind of man occupy in man. For it is invisible, though it sees everything itself. And it has an essence which is undiscernible, though it can discern the essence the essences of all other things, and making for itself by art and science all sorts of roads uh, leading in diverse directions and all plain. It traverses land and sea, investigating everything which is contained in either element. I really, uh, as you can see, I, I highlighted that, but I, I really adore that uh, that line of that line of reasoning and the uh the idea of i remember plato had i forget which dialogue was going through something similar about the senses and their limitations and how the power of sight or the power of hearing as a power are themselves the cause of what you see and hear so you could hear and see different things right but you can never see sight and you can never hear 
hearing. Those are something tra- that sub- that subsumes all things seen and all things heard, uh, and is indiscernible, but causes all discernment. So it's a it's a very similar idea. The same idea. Do you want to read it? Eventually, but I don't have it with me. Oh, I mean, like the that phrase you highlighted. Did you want to? Oh well, yeah. I mean, the, the naive idea of man made in the image of God. People have like the Mormons have a literal idea that there's physically a being that is God with flesh and bones <laughs> that <laughs> that exists on some planet out there, you know, because God says we were made in his image. So if we want, want to know God, just look at ourselves. And I just love the way he worded that, you know, that for nothing is, that is born on the earth is more resembling God than man. And let no one think that he is able to judge of this likeness from the characters of the body, for neither is God a being with the form of man, nor is the human body like the form of God. But the resemblance is spoken of with reference to the most important part of the soul, namely the mind. It's just, it's good. That's kind of like uh, with Vernadsky, where he, he forms the newosphere. Um, and he, he's referring that man is, well, at least on earth, that we're superior in a way where we have we form a, an extra zone in our earthly uh, what it, the layers of the earth and he calls it the newosphere and according to Vernadsky that's the highest form of um, these spheres <laughs> yes yes absolutely no it, it has a similar quality yeah it's also akin to uh, a lot of the uh, new stuff in science these days to do with consciousness the universe being a living consciousness which I don't want to say is new in human thought, clearly, look at uh, what we just read, but but it is a, a, a newer area of science. Yeah, I mean, it, it's something which the the occultists and the theosophists uh, have wanted. They, they promote that, and uh, and people like Philo and his current also promotes it. But there's something missing in the panpsychist, you know, the the whitehead Russell or more whitehead approach to consciousness being uh, ubiquitous, which is devoid of more moral reason that that's taken completely out of the construct in the uh, the occult variation that's often promoted in the uh, the mystical sciences today. Um, so as long as one is is aware of that different difference in, mm-hmm. in the two uh ways to see a, a living universe or a universe endowed with life and reason then uh, you're good yeah you can navigate through the minefield a lot of people just they they don't they don't have that that in their in their heads when they're trying to discern i'm interested in what you think matt about the uh after saying that about uh um the the image of god and stuff like that what you think of the incarnation the yes. incarn- incarnation yeah of 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 jesus and stuff like that because because that's that most mm-hmm. christians believe that jesus was god and so mm-hmm. that god became man at that at that point so i'm just kind of interested how mm. think about that that's a yeah it's a i i mean i tend to approach it from a an epis, epistemic standpoint that that um like that's my view i'm not saying that this is the mm-hmm. right view i'm just this is where i'm at um, I tend to see it as uh, as that Christ was the maximum moral embodiment of goodness and the divine in a, in a human form that was uh, possible and the, the greatest giving, loving human being um, who's ever lived. Um, so though we all have the divine, you know, quality, to use that as our guide or our blueprint to aim to strive towards as that perfect goodness uh will never will always fall short obviously we're we're humans with all of the the limitations so i i just sort of see it from that standpoint um yeah so in other words you don't so you don't really think that jesus was god I don't know. It's it's like a long discussion. It it it, it mm-hmm. requires like more fleshing out of the terms and more context. So it's a big one for me, you know. Like I, I can't yeah. say it as a yeah. We'd have to know, huh? have to know more of the historical Jesus 
Well, it's not just that. Like we, you know, we we there's elements of that, but the, it, again, it's it's such a big, big, philosophically rich uh, topic. I I just don't want to under yeah. undervalue it by just throwing out some some shorthand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Wrist buzz. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I'd like to add. Uh, um... A Philo, he re- he refers a lot, um, the, like the Pythagorean uh, numbers, like he mentions thirty days in the month and three hundred sixty five or three hundred sixty days. I think he's referring to, but it's really three hundred sixty five. Um, I think that's interesting. It's just the, there isn't thirty days in a month. It's like twenty eight point, you know, something something. It's uh. It's not 360, it's 365. It's not 12 months, it's 12 point something. Yeah. Yep. I just thought I'd add that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, one one would be hard pressed to find a, a, a perfect whole number anywhere in, in the physical creation. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's kind of what I wanted to say. It's not, it's close, it's enough to get our attention. Yep. But there's something more going on. Yep. Good observation. All right, let's uh let's kick her back into gear and uh we'll find we'll find appropriate places to pause and chat uh, along the way. I have to add one comment to that. Of course, Susie. So when you're talking about that math, it actually shows that it's incomplete. Yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, it's good. It's a I mean, sign that the universe isn't finished, right? It's a it's a it's a creation it's a creation, not a created. The whole of the discussion on the uh, Pythagorean comma is exactly in line with that, Matthew. Yeah, Quan did a great it, job. It, of, it was uh, an adjustment. Yeah. You know, harmonic resonance exists in a certain pattern in the universe, but humanity comes along and makes a slight adjustment so that we can understand and use that harmonic resonance. Mm. As you say, it's a creation, ongoing creation. Yeah, well, maybe we'll we'll slide in some some Kuza at some point um, soon because Kuza has got a great Nick Cardinal Nicholas of Kuza has a really wonderful approach to this this question of the the uh, incommensurability between the the imagined circle and the imagined world of of perfection and the discoverable world of becoming that we're we're navigating through of the lower reality and how. Um, no circle could physically be drawn that couldn't be improved upon, right? That there's no way that you you could, but though you could have, though the idea of the circle that we have in our mind is perfect, is perfect. We have the the concept of the perfect circle, right? And he just develops that in a really wonderful way as a metaphor for some really really wonderful uh, metaphysics. Okay. Sure. So, and again, being raised up on a wings and so surveying and contemplating the air and all the commotions to which it is subject, it is borne upwards to the higher firmament and to the revolutions of the heavenly bodies. And also being itself involved in the revolutions of the planets and fixed stars according to the perfect laws of music and being led on by love which is the guide of wisdom it proceeds onward till having surmounted all essence intelligible by the external senses it comes to aspire to such as is perceptible only by the intellect and perceiving in that the original models and ideas of those things intelligible by the external senses, which it saw here full of surpassing beauty, it becomes seized with a sort of sober intoxication like the zealots engaged in the Corybantian festivals and yields to enthusiasm 
becoming filled with another desire and a more excellent longing by which it is conducted onwards to the very summit of such things as are perceptible only to the intellect till it appears to be reaching the great king himself. And while it is eagerly longing to behold him pure and unmingled, rays of divine light are poured for forth upon it like a torrent, so as to bewilder the eyes of its intelligence by their splendor. But as it is not every image that resembles its archetypal model, since many are unlike, Moses, uh, Moses has shown this by adding to the words after his image, the expression in his likeness to prove that it means an accurate impression having a clear and evident resemblance in form. And he would not err who would raise the question why Moses attributed the creation of man alone, not to one creator, as he did that of other animals, but, but to several. For he introduces the father of the universe using this language. Let us make man after our image and in our likeness. Had he them... Uh, had he then, shall I say, need of any one whatever to help him, he to whom all things are subject? Or when he was making the heaven and the earth and the sea, was he in need of no one to cooperate with him? And yet was he unable himself by his own power to make man and animals so short-lived and so exposed to the assaults of, of fate without the assistance of others? It is plain that the real cause of his so acting is known to God alone, but one which to a reasonable conjecture appears probable and credible, I think I should not conceal, and it is this. Of existing things, there are some which partake neither of virtue nor of, nor of vice, as, for instance, plants and irrational animals, the one because they are destitute of soul and are regulated by nature void of sense, and the other because they are not endowed with mind of reason. But mind and reason may be looked upon as the abode, uh, abode, uh, abode, abode of virtue and vice as it is in them, and they seem to dwell. Some things, again, partake of virtue alone without uh, being without any participation in any kind of vice, as, for instance, the stars, for they are said to be animals. And animals endowed with intelligence, as I might rather say, the mind of each of them is wholly and entirely virtuous and unsusceptible of every kind of evil. Some, kinds, uh, some things, again, are of a mixed nature, like man, who is capable of opposite qualities of wisdom and folly, of temperance and dissoluteness, of courage and cowardice, of justice and injustice, in short of good and evil, of what is honorable and what is disgraceful of virtue and vice. Now, it was a very appropriate task for God, the Father of all, to create by himself alone those things which were wholly good, on account of their kindred with himself. And it is, and it was not inconsistent with his dignity to create those which were indifferent, since they are devoid of evil, which is hateful to him. To create the beings of a mixed nature was partly consistent and partly inconsistent 
with his dignity, consistent by reason of the more excellent idea which is mingled in them, inconsistent because of the opposite and worse one. It is on this account that Moses says, as the creation of man alone, that God said, let us make man, which expression shows an assumption of other beings to himself as assistance, in order that God, the governor of all things, might have all the blameless intentions and actions of man when he does right attributed to him. And that his other assistants might bear the imputation of his contrary actions. For it was fitting that the father should, in the eyes of his children, be free from all imputation of evil and vice and energy in accordance with vice are evil. I just like to say beautiful. one thing here. Yeah. Um, this isn't like a religious, like we're this text, and I don't know what people might think of this, but what Philo is, is doing in his commentaries on the book of Moses um, is to try to find or infuse some reasoning into things that are written, but without much context uh, regarding the story of Moses. So he's trying to like find in the best of his way or as possible as his mind is capable, uh, rational, reasonable causes for the words used and for other things uh, embedded within that, that text um, to give people more mental muscle. As far as the question of like the language of let us make him in his image, I, I don't know. Is this is this in the Jewish Bible or is this also like I have my um, my King James Bible here and I don't re didn't recollect that language in the Bible I have or the Old Testament that I, I have access to. Is that is that the case? No, because um... or no, actually, Declan, what are your what are your thoughts on that quick? Um, well, generally, I've always heard as a Catholic let us make man in our image and, it, and the plural and it, it's taken to imply the trinity the trinity at that point yeah and right so but okay. yeah coming from a jewish perspective they don't necessarily believe in the trinity and so i don't know how he's reading it at his time yeah i don't know if he's reading it as 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 he's thinking of angels or something that that take the burden of some of the evilness or whatever that that is being infused in the mixed creature creature of men is that how he's thinking and then god's perfect or quan what, what was your uh what was your thought on that okay before i i go into philosophical considerations i would okay. like to mention some philological considerations okay because at the time of philo so he was born in 20 BCE and he died in 50 CE. Mm. Uh, they already, I'm not sure that Philo read that well Hebrew first. Okay. He was Great. a Jew of Alexandria. Mm. So I'm not sure that he read so well Hebrew. So probably that his most uh, master language was probably Koine Greek. And let's not forget that there was a translation called the Septuagint who has been done in about the 287 BCE or the order of Ptolemy II. So he probably was speculating from the Greek version. And let's not forget, I make a jump in time here. The first time that Christendom get access to what is called the Hebrew Bible was during the Reformation in the 15th and 16th century. So from the time of Ptolemy, the third century BCE, everything was from the Greek tradition, the Greek translation of the Septuagint. So, and in the Greek translation of the Septuagint, there was a lot of uh, angelic considerations, uh, which was not a concept that is so uh, powerful in the Hebrew original one, because uh, Later on, you have many translations which indicates that sometimes some Greek concept has been introduced that was absent in the original Hebrew. Uh, here, I would like to, now I, I, I'm sorry for that long philological consideration, but now I would like to go into the philosophical consideration because most of the time, the question of freedom, the question of good and evil 
most of the time has been discussed as God wants to let man be completely free to be evil if he chooses to be so. And here I'm very surprised that Philo decided to put that seat of evil on the angels or the demiurge, okay? Because you know perfectly that in certain theology, people would make the distinction between God the Father, which is the supreme God of all beauty, goodness, and truth, and the demiurge, which is the God, the second God, or the subordinate God, responsible for the creation of the material universe. And here we have something like that, because uh, the notion of imperfection seems to come from the assistance of God the Father, according to Philo understanding. So I see here as another theological trend to explain the possibility of evil, rather than the standard explication, uh, explanation based on freedom and free choice, precisely. Yeah, yeah, right. Hmm. Okay. And you know that there's a theology later on by a guy named Maxion, M-A-S-C-I-O-N, that would use exactly the same reasoning. And let's not forget, I'm sorry to go back again, the Trinity has been clearly defined only in 325, right? So practically 300 years after Philo. As for the Council of Nicaea and the, the codif codification of it. Huh, yeah. Okay, so... Well, I wonder how the early church fathers pre-Nicaea Nicaea were... I haven't read enough of them to to see their thoughts of that um, in its... In its pre-Nicene form. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, let's forget about let's forget mm -hmm. about that. Okay, I would say that the the discussion here mm -hmm. is what would appeal the most to reason that evil or evil actions would be because God let us be completely free, or because of a defect of fabrication at the origins mm. that we are not responsible. That mm. is the theological center of the right. stuff. That's the crux. Yeah. Right. Okay. And okay. Um, I prefer the explanation that we have been let completely free rather than being the victim of a defect of manufacturing. Agreed. I am also partial to that. Yeah, I have to share in that one. If that's so, then uh, if there's a defect in manufacturing, then I want a refund. Yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah, we all get a social credit score before we die. <laughs> that's pretty funny, actually. There's a, a Babylonian version of uh, the creation of man um, yeah. where there's instead of one God, there were several gods. Uh, I think I think the, the actual story, there were six men and six women and something to do with between all of them. They they made man. That's just a general version of the story. But that would that would make sense. Boy. With it's the word like where, Sorry, where it says let us make man, you know, where in in the Jewish Bible, like what does let us mean? Who's us? Yeah. You mean the six goddesses and the six gods from Sumeria and Babylonia. You mean that probably. Yeah, I'm just getting I'm just saying maybe the when they wrote the the gen the early Genesis part, um I'm assuming they were a captive in Babylonia at the time when that was written down. Yeah. And maybe well, they got that version from the the Babylonians or the Sumerians version oh, of creation. Oh, oh, you don't have to make hypothesis. It has been proven beyond any doubt that the Enuma Elish, which is the Akkadian expression, Enuma Elish, is the exact uh, 
background from Sumeria or Sumer for the writing of the Genesis. So here, I don't think the fact that the Jews inherited the intellectual and mm -hmm. cultural legacy from Sumer and Babylon, for me, is not a big deal, okay? Because the same great questioning about the reality of the universe and the reality of the soul and the mind of man are universal questions for any human beings anyway. So that they have used the Enuma Elish as a kind of a template for their own genesis, for me, is not a big deal. It has been proved uh, a long time ago. I mean, uh, two, three generations ago. If you did, you read the book by Noah Kramer, K R A M E R. If you want to go into uh, scholarly details about the Sumerian and Babylon Babylonian background of the Genesis. You can read the book by Noah Kramer, and it has been written more than 60 or 70 years ago. Mm, yeah. I have a hypothesis to share with all of you here. Uh, just something while I was hearing you speak, Quan. Um, God is, uh, they say God said in the past, but then he speaks in the present. Let us make man. Uh but if we play with the present tense, uh, maybe God is, is making man with us. <laughs> uh, look, I see that uh, you can be a brilliant theologian. You have a, a future in theology. Because, because in a way, uh, right. the, the time, if it's not linear and it's simultaneous with all of time, yeah. Uh, that means he's speaking to us who can hear his voice uh, because he's saying it now. Yeah, well, theoretically, when we speak about God, it has always to be in the present because he's in timelessness. Mm. Exactly. So, but the Luke, God, that... oh, sorry. I was just going to say, Luke, that was really, really beautiful. Very inspired. But I have to go ahead and ask, whenever I read that scripture, I am quite used to thinking of this is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. And that's why he is saying, let us make man in our image so i guess my question is that is not universally understood by everybody else who reads this passage uh, no there are different interpretations of that wow well, well what the is beauty the beauty yeah, the of man is is that we all have our perspective yeah but we can have a, I would say, an epistemological on that, uh, the interpretation about that, okay? Because uh, uh, the three major principles of reason or the three major timeless form being beauty, goodness, and truth. Uh, and it's only my answer. I don't have the pretension to... <laughs> to uh, oh, but that overlays perfectly as well. Uh, well... That's my religion, okay? Because for me, the three timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth are pre precisely the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father. Exactly. And the, the Father fa is perfect beauty. Jesus uh, modeled for us goodness, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay. sorry, did you have something different there? Uh. Well, I would say that I would put the Father as truth because it's the source. Uh, truth is, is, but it's debatable. But uh, my theology, okay, put inverted comma, is that Father would be the source, that would be truth. And I agree with you that Jesus would be the perfect incarnation of goodness. And beauty would be the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the love uniting the Father 
and the sun, but manifesting into phenomenal reality too. Because let's not forget that beauty is a timeless form that is the closest to the time dimension or the animal kingdom. Let's not forget that in Philotex, uh, God is creating heaven and earth and after the animals mm -hmm. and after man, okay? So uh, beauty is the form of, uh, reflect is the timeless form, but also manifesting as uh, the physical shapes. Uh, okay, the Greek word for timeless form is idos, but the Greek word for the time shapes is plastikon, okay? So you have there the beauty in timelessness manifesting in the beauty in time. And because mm -hmm. of the love between the father and the son, okay? Because the three timeless form, as in the Trinity, are not separated, okay? It's one, but manifested as three timeless forms. Because God is one, but he's three, okay? That, that is here, that mm -hmm. the way I can understand that mystery is precisely by truth, goodness, and beauty. Because mm -hmm. truth, goodness, and beauty are three different timeless forms, but those three are not separated. They are three uh, apparitions of the same universal and timeless principle. Mm -hmm. Distinction without separation. Exactly. And... And when I say mythology, I say it respectfully, okay? Mythology is not low for me. Mythology is very important. Uh, uh, we, can the, think, we can think of the word mythology in the academic sense. Yes, in the sense that some um, abstract principles sometimes have been translated in words that are closer to the hearts of human beings, okay? Uh, uh, let's say intellectual like me can appreciate the uh, uh, abstract concept like beauty, goodness, and truth. But maybe for most people, they would be more touched by the idea of a family, okay, of uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And in that sense that I use the word mythology, meaning the symbolic translation of abstract principles. Hmm. I agree with your attributions there, uh, Kwan. I'm not somebody who's burdened by uh, religious theology and everything like that. So concepts of Holy Trinity for me are things that I would normally approach from a philosophical perspective. Your three descriptions there, the uh, the only one, and I'm not questioning it, my understanding of um, beauty, for example, would simply be the natural world. The world as it is with all of its laws that are fixed throughout the universe, et cetera, et cetera. That, that is, for me, what the Holy Spirit represents. The other two, goodness, Jesus Christ is a very good example of that, the potential of it at least. And, of course, truth has to be God. Yeah. Yeah, because truth meaning the whole reality, okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, it has to be the biggest guy, if I may say so. Hmm. The, the well, only I, part for me that's, that's still a bit of a mystery, if you like, in, in, a, in terms of it's so uncertain and very hard to, to prove, to come to solid conclusions, um, I mean, is the notion of incorporeal forms. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with you completely, for example, that, uh, you know, um, human beings operating entirely on the basis of their own free will is pretty much where I'm centered at the moment, but one can't ignore all of the mythological discussion of angels, demons, you know, incorporeal forms that have played a role in human history one way or another. Whether real or not, they have influ influenced the psychology and therefore the actions of human beings over time. And just one more quick little comment. I can't help it. Uh, um, timelessness. I love the concept of timelessness. Here we are sitting around discussing similar ideas that the writers, Philo in this case, and uh, um, others that we've read from thousands of years ago, and we're still kind of discussing exactly the same ideas. There's a timelessness about that. Yeah. 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 So a uh, reoccurring well, hold that idea thought. over time. 
I was just going to say a reoccurring idea over time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, uh, forgive me to interrupt. Timelessness is precisely outside of time. That's right. Really uh, nice. Okay, so it's not time. Timelessness is really because it's being and becoming. Okay, so timelessness is something that is not subject to the laws of becoming. Because uh, we are always talking about the principles and what what are, what is or what are becoming. Okay, so the principles are precisely those. Uh, laws of reason that uh, have always been there, will be there forever. And uh, it's forever, it, even is not good, okay? Because forever, is a, a, there is a, an undertone of time. It is completely outside time. It is completely outside becoming. Mm. It just is. Yeah, just is, exactly. Because you know that the Greek, like the Chinese, like the Indians, they don't believe that the universe has a beginning, okay? It has always been there, and that is precisely timelessness. And you can have you can have cycles, okay? You can have cycles, for example, the Big Bang or not the Big Bang, doesn't matter. You can have cycles, but being is not part of becoming. It has always been there and it will always be there. I like that approach. Declan, I, I know that you, you were going to say something. Does do you still want to say it or uh, yeah. did, did the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking we we're talking about uh, God represented in truth, goodness, and beauty in the, in the Trinity. And I was reminded of something I learned uh, actually when I was studying uh, um, Plato's uh, uh, symposium about love. You you hear or you hear the expression "God is love," and it always seems kind of a weird thing to say. But when you think about it, God uh, you you could explain God is love in a very uh, trinitarian perspective because you need three things for love: you need a lover, a beloved, and the love between them. And so traditionally, the Trinity is seen as the Father being the lover, the Son being the beloved, and the Holy Spirit being the love between them. And so the love between the Father and the Son is so strong that it creates a whole separate third person in the Trinity. And so you have that, that constant triangle of love that, that is the Trinity, and that's why God is love. And I always thought that was, that was blew my mind. Yeah, that is yeah. beautiful. I I think that that's actually one of the uh, one of the beautiful aspects of thinking about God as a as a creative, like having an idea of a living creative God instead of this idea of like a, a stagnant uh, stasis God. Is Watchmaker. That, yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> that there's this this poetry that that's implicit in the mind of a poet which would be also implicit in the mind of the creator. And, and you could always find a poetic expression to embody vocally or in words, uh, concepts that are, that are not what you said exactly, but they're expressed truthfully in that poetic imagery. And you could find mm -hmm. the Trinity concept uh, facilitated as, as Quan went through very beautifully just a, a few moments ago. Um, yeah. The variety of things we choose to look at, we could find these universal lessons about God, God's character in its essence in the in the smallest of things if if we're searching if we're not searching we won't find it could be right in front of our face and mm -hmm. we'll miss the metaphor we'll we'll miss the allegory left and right but what yeah. you just said is great about the about love yeah mm -hmm. it's like love love is a like a force like magnetism or electricity perhaps it's causal mm -hmm. or stronger yeah. than that yeah well you know that there are some crazy physicists that say that the attraction between electron and protons is a form of inferior love. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Yes. And after, to... and after all, it's very brilliant because we can have the seven degree of love. So. Well, St. Because... Augustine. Oh, yeah, go on. Keep going. No, no, no go on. Go on. Go on. No, I was going to say St. Augustine uh, develops this uh, very much. So I, I think it's in his... Uh... Uh, 
on education or is it i forget which one yeah i think it's on on education where he's describing the 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 love of a rock to the ground the love of a fire but everything has a love the bees have a love that animates them when they when they seek pollen and and procreation and replenishing their species and you know everything seeks its place like there's there's a nature built into everything that ha- that exists which it's 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 happy right the the plant is happy when it receives sunlight in the right amount of water not too much or too little and um and there's loves for human beings that should not be loved right you have inordinate loves so with other other animals they're they're pure and good they don't they don't have evil because they love what they should love human beings we don't always love with what, what we should love because we love things that will actually make us ironically unhappy in the long run though we give in to momentary happiness in the short term and so augustine categorizes all of those loves that create a later longing or pain by their absence as being in inor- inordinate loves and i think plato has his own language for that too um which is uh yeah, it's it's a rich way of thinking about the that everything is animated, as you were saying, with loves. Now, I don't know what you were saying about the the seven types of love or seven types of. That's a new one for me. What, what's that? Yeah, that's part of the healthy gnosis from um, Plotinus or from Ammoniosakas or, or, or even Origen. Okay, Origen hmm. uh, was a classmate of Plotinus, and uh, the, the teacher of the two was uh, Ammoniosakas. And maybe you remember that origin of the around he died around 250 uh, was the first having created the first systematic Christian theology. Okay, and in that first uh, systematic Christian theology, he would uh, use that uh, higher that healthy Gnostic hierarchy in terms of love, and the highest love is the love where you have absolute freedom. And when you go you go back step by step to let's say lower realms, and in lower realms you have more constraint, you have more laws governing your behavior or governing reality. So absolute love corresponds to absolute freedom because there's only one law, and that is the law of love. That's you cool. can uh, in a scientific way. You could have a whole nother conversation about just not just love, but other emotions, perhaps like anger, um, yeah. jealousy. Uh, that could be a whole nother conversation. Well, that's that's in the uh, in the, the healthy gnosis. Uh, the inferior emotions are precisely because they are more mechanical laws. When you go yeah. into the lower realms. Because the absolute freedom or the absolute love at the highest level has been degraded at each step that you go down. For example, the law of gravitation is a limitation. Okay, And when uh, some crazy physicists, very influenced by healthy gnosis, would say that the attraction between proton and electrons is an inferior form of love, they are not ignorant of the healthy gnosis of Plotinus or of origin. Oh, um, uh, origin, is that like I always call it origin? Is that the same? Uh, it's, it's written. Origin? Uh, it's pronounced uh, O-R-I-G-E-N. But you know, I'm not a reference for English pronunciation. Oh. So if you pronounce Oregon, I don't, okay. <laughs> I don't mind. Okay. So it's written O-R-I-G-E-N. Yeah. I think it is mostly pronounced origin. Yeah. Because you pronounce that di- you pronounce diogen. Okay. If you pronounce diogen, yeah. probably that origin is pronounced origin. Yeah. Diogenes also. I- I'm just English. I-, I don't understand Greek very well. I'm trying. Shall we continue uh, for the next few sections? And and Luke, do you are you happy reading, or do you want to switch up? Uh, I think somebody can can read. Somebody else. Any volunteers? I'll jump in, Matthew, if you like. I'm getting plenty of practice reading your material. If thou wilt. Yeah, Zach and I are, are, are still continuing with our little project. You'll hear more about it, I'm sure. Oh, good. So from uh, from yeah. seventy six. Oh, it's not without its minor problems. You know, I, I I did a reading of the second part of um. 
the uh, um, how Jesus and his followers saved humanity, but it went for an hour and 20 minutes, which actually meant I couldn't send the bloody file. I had to find a program to cut it in half and send two halves to uh, to Zach. And we're going to have a conversation about that tonight. So, Oy vey. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he wanted to show you last week. That's why we, we tried to stick around because he, he he showed yeah. me eventually what it is that he's done, and it, it actually looks quite good. The setting is, is really good. I was impressed with what he's done. Now the burden falls on me to try and present uh, present him with um, quality audio and video, which is uh, not so easy to do. Anyway, let's continue from seventy six. Mm -hmm. Okay. And very beautifully, after he had called the whole race man, did he distinguish between the sexes? saying that they were created male and female, although all the individuals of the race had not yet assumed their distinctive form. Since the extreme species are contained in the genus and are beheld, as in a mirror, by those who are able to discern ac uh, acutely. And someone may inquire the cause why it was that man was the last work in the creation of the world. For the creator and father created him after everything else, as the sacred scriptures inform us. Accordingly, they who have gone most deeply into the laws and who to the best of their power have investigated everything that is contained in them with all diligence say that God, when he had given to man to partake of kindred with himself, grudged him neither reason, which is the most excellent of all gifts, nor anything else that is good, but before his creation provided for him everything in the world as for the animal most resembling himself and dearest to him, being desirous that when he was born, he should be in want of nothing requisite for living and for living well. The first of which objects is provided for by the abundance of supplies which are furnished to him for his enjoyment, and the other by his power of contemplation of the heavenly bodies by which the mind is smitten so as to conceive a love and desire for knowledge on those subjects." owing to which desire philosophy has sprung up, by which man, though mortal, is made immortal. And then, those who make a feast do not invite their guests to the entertainment before they have provided everything for festivity. And as those who celebrate gymnastic or dramatic contents, contests, before they assemble the spectators, provide themselves with an abundance of competitors and spectacles and sweet sounds with which to fill the theatres and the stadia. So in the same manner did the ruler of all, as a man proposing games or giving a banquet and being about to invite others to feast and to behold the spectacle, first provide everything for every kind of entertainment, in order that when man, man came into the world, he might at once find a feast ready for him and a most holy theatre, the one abounding with everything which the earth or the rivers or the sea or air brings forth for use and enjoyment, and the other being full of every description of light which has either its essence or its qualities admirable and its motions and revolutions worthy of notice being arranged in perfect order, both as to the proportions of its numbers and the harmony of its periods. And a man would not be far wrong who should say that in all these things, there might be discovered that archetypal and real model music, the images of which the subsequent generations of mankind engraved in their own souls and in this way handed down the art, which is the most necessary and the most ad advantageous to human life. This is the first reason on account of which it seems that man was created after all other animals. And there is another not altogether unreasonable, which I must mention. At the moment of his first birth, man found all the requisites for life ready prepared for him that he might teach them to those who should come afterwards. Nature, all but crying out with a distinct voice that men, imitating the author of their being, should pass their lives without labour and without trouble, living in the most ungrudging abundance and a plenty. And this would be the case if there were neither irrational pleasures to obtain mastery over the soul, raising up a wall of gluttony and lasciviousness, nor desires of glory or power or riches to assume dominion over life, nor pains to contract and warp the intellect, nor that evil counsellor, fear, to restrain the natural inclinations toward virtuous actions, nor folly and cowardice and injustice and the incalculable multitude of other evils to attack them. By now that all the evils which I have now been mentioning are vigorous and that men abandon themselves without restraint to their passions and to those unbridled and guilty inclinations, 
which it is impious even to mention, justice encounters them as a suitable chastiser of wicked habits, and therefore, as a punishment for wrongdoers, the necessaries of life have been made difficult of acquisition. For men ploughing up the plains with difficulty and bringing streams from rivers and fountains by channels and sowing and planting and submitting indefatigably day and night to the labour of cultivating the ground, provide themselves every year with what is necessary, even that at times being attended with pain, not very sufficient in quantity from being injured by many causes. For either a fall of incessant rain has carried away the crops or the weight of hail which has fallen upon them has crushed them all together, or snow has chilled them, or the violence of the wind has torn them up by the roots. For water and air cause many alterations, tending to destroy and productiveness of the crops. I think that is tending to destroy any productiveness of the crops. But I it think you're wrong. right. Yep. But if the immoderate violence of the passions were appeased by temperance, and the inclination to do wrong and depraved ambition were correct by justice, corrected by justice, and in short, if the vices and unhallowed actions done in accordance with them were corrected by the virtues and the energies in accordance with them, the war of the soul being terminated, which is in good truth the most grievous and heavy of all wars, and peace being established and founding amid all our faculties a due regard for law with all tranquility and mildness, then there would be hope that God, as being a friend to virtue and a friend to honour and above all a friend to man, would bestow upon the race of man all kinds of spontaneous blessings from his ready store. For it is evident that it is easier to supply most abundantly the requisite supplies without having recourse to agricultural means from treasures which already exist than to bring forth what as yet has no existence. I have now mentioned the second reason. There is also a third, which is as follows. God, intending to adapt the beginning and the end of all created things together, as being all necessary and dear to one another, made heaven the beginning and man the end, the one being the most perfect of incorruptible things among those things which are perceptible by the external senses, and the other, the best of all earthborn earth and perishable productions, a short-lived heaven, if one were to speak the truth, bearing within himself many star-like natures by means of certain arts and sciences, and illustrious speculations according to every kind of virtue. For since the corruptible and the incorruptible are by nature opposite, he has allotted the best thing of each species to the beginning and to the end. Heaven, as I before said, to the beginning and man to the end. And besides all this, another is also mentioned among the necessary causes. It was necessary that man should be the last of all created beings in order that being so, and appearing suddenly, he might strike terror into the other animals. For, for it was fitting that they, as soon as they for, first saw him, should admire and worship him as their natural ruler and master, on which account they all, as soon as they saw him, became tame before him, even those whose by nature were most savage, becoming at once most manageable at the first sight of him, displaying their unbridled ferocity to one another, and being tame to man alone. For which reason the Father who made him to be a dominant over them by nature, not merely in fact, but also by express verbal appointment, established him as the king of all the animals, beneath the moon, whether terrestrial or, or aquatic, or such as traverse the air. For every mortal thing which lives in the three elements, land, water, or air, did he put in subjection to him, excepting only the beings that are in heaven, as creatures who have a more divine proportion. And what is apparent to our eyes is the most evident proof of this. For at times, innumerable herds of beasts are led about by one man, not armed, nor wearing iron, nor any defensive uh, weapon, but clad only in a skin for a garment and carrying a staff, for the purpose of making signs and to lean upon also in his journeys if he become weary. And so the shepherd and the goat herd and the cow herd lead numerous flocks of sheep and goats and herds of oxen, men neither vigorous nor active in their bodies, so as to strike those who behold them with admiration because of their fine appearance, and all the might and power of such numerous and well-armed beasts, for they have means of self-defense given them by nature, yet dread them as slaves do their master, 
and do all that is commanded them. Bulls are yoked to the plough to till the ground and cutting deep furrows all day, sometimes even for a long space of time together, while some farmer is managing them. And rams being weighed down with heavy fleeces of wool in the spring season, at the command of the shepherd, stand quietly and lying down without resistance, permit their wool to be shorn off, being accustomed naturally, like cities, to yield a yearly tribute to their sovereign. And moreover, that most spirited of animals, the horse, is easily guided after he has been bridled in order that he may not become frisky and shake off the rein. And he hollows his back in an admirable manner to receive his rider and to afford him a good seat. And then bearing him aloft, he gallops at a rapid pace, being eager to arrive at and carry him to the place to which he is urging him. And the rider without any toil, but in the most perfect quiet, makes a rapid journey by using the body and feet of another animal. And anyone who is inclined to dwell upon this subject might bring forward a great many other instances to prove that there is no animal in the enjoyment of perfect liberty and exempt from the dominion of man. But what has been already said is sufficient by way of example. We ought, however, not to be ignorant of this also, that it is no proof, because man was the last created animal, that he is the lowest in rank and charioteers and pilots are witnesses of this. For the charioteers sit behind their beasts of burden and are placed at their backs. And yet when they have the reins in their hands, they guide them wherever they choose. And at one time they urge them on to a swift pace. And at another time they hold them back if they are going on at a speed greater than is desirable. And pilots again, sitting in the hindmost part of the ship, that is the stern, are, as one may say, the most important of all the people in the ship, inasmuch as they have the safety of the ship and all of those who are in it in their hands. And so the Creator has made man to be, as it were, a charioteer and pilot over all other animals, in order that he may hold the reins and direct the course of everything upon earth, having the superintendence of all animals and plants, and as a sort of viceroy of the principal and mighty king. But after the whole world had been completed according to the perfect nature of the number six the father hallowed the day following the seventh praising it and calling it holy for that day is the festival not of one city or one country but of all the earth a day which alone it is right to call the day of festival for all people and the birthday of the world and i know not if anyone would be able to celebrate the nature of the number seven in adequate terms since it is superior to every form of expression but it does not follow that because it is more admirable than anything that can be said of it, that on that account one ought to keep silence. But rather we ought to try, even if one cannot say everything which is proper, or even that which is most proper, at all events to utter such things as may be attainable by our capacities. The number seven is spoken of in two ways. The one within the number ten, which is measured by repeating the unit alone seven times, and which consists of seven units, the other is the number outside 10, the beginning of which is altogether the unit increasing according to a twofold or threefold or any other proportion whatever, as are the numbers 64 and 729, the one number of which is increased by doubling on from the unit and the other by trebling. And it is not well to examine either species superficially, but the second has a most manifest preeminence. Sorry, just quick, uh, here, uh, when he's referring to 64 and 729, is he referring specifically to like eight times eight um, as far as like eight squared and maybe like eight cubed? Is it does eight cubed mean 729? What is that? Yeah. It, it Is that a yes? Like, are you agreeing with my question or is that the answer? I think 64 times 64 is 729. 64... No. No, 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 no. Sorry, what am I saying? No. Where do, where do we get the 729 from? That was my question. Yeah. yeah. So I just want 27, to... the square root of 27. Yeah, what is that? It's oh, the square root of 27. 27. Oh, I see. Okay. I see, I see. Okay. And, and and 27 is uh, the cube, uh, uh, the cube, cube of, of three. Uh, three. three. Right, yeah. yeah. Three times three times three. So three cubed is 27. So that is... And you're saying it's the square root of seven. That's the square root of yes. of okay. The square. Okay, so 
All right. So that's going to be three to the sixth power, right? Okay. Yes. Three to the sixth. Okay. And then I in the context it. of what he's saying, all he knows. Yeah, but uh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's interesting because three is the three timeless form or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to the six, the six days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's I, I'm not saying it's the truth, but it's one possible interpretation. An obvious connection. Mm. Hmm. I think I say, it's, uh, it, it's part of the potential of numbers. There can be a lot of connections in number that we attribute meaning to. Well, Paul, uh, you know that in Confucianism, uh, um, there is a branch of Confucianism where you have a lot of numerology and that numerology can be symbolically very interesting. Yeah. And the little exercise that I just said about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and exponent six for the six days uh, reminds very much of that kind of numerological speculation yeah. that you can have with yeah. the I Ching. I would say that it's beautiful symbolically, but it can go a little bit too far sometimes. Yes, it's what I mean by people can often read meaning into numbers and patterns of numbers that don't necessarily um, have the meaning that they they prescribe. I mean, Kabbalah, for example, is full of that sort of stuff. Absolutely. I would say that uh, apart from the Chinese tradition, uh, the Kabbalah is probably a, uh, a source of uh, interesting and wide numerolog numerological speculations. Yeah, very wild. <laughs> yeah. And look, it's it's still going on. It, you know, I mean, for fun, sometimes you know, over the past years, I've watched presentations along these lines just to see how far the imagination goes in those areas. And and uh, you know, you you can start by by re recognizing that the very first assumption made is dead wrong, but then the argument continues, and it can kind of be fun to to follow the argument. You know, the rationality of it if you like even though you know or you believe that the assumption upon which it's predicated is wrong right from the start i can't yeah. give an example off the top of my head but but there's plenty of examples yeah but in in the order of principles i would say that it is interesting because uh, the intellect uh, uh, that is uh, a second layer of epistemological development has a certain power but is constrained by a lot the precisely of laws okay but it's it's an illustration that the play that you have uh, or the games that you can have within the intellect has to be supervised by higher epistemological layers. I would say that that would be the philosophical lesson. Mm. Mm. Yeah, agreed. Uh, in the sense that you always have to see if it's under the lawfulness of beauty, goodness, and truth. And if it's not within the law lawfulness of beauty, goodness, and truth, it means that the, the intellect was spinning too much of uh, wine speculations. That's all. Mm -hmm. Hey, I, I have a question. Uh, what is the number seven? Is um, when they say ten by repeating the unit alone seven times. Did everybody catch that? Because I, I didn't get it. One plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one. Seven times. The one. The well, that's one what that sentence means. Because measuring... Yeah in two ways and okay the number seven is spoken of in two ways you're speaking of that look yes the one within the number 10 which is measure by repeating the unit alone seven times yeah that's a very complicated thing to say that you repeat one seven times but why does it mention 10 Oh, he just means it because he's saying if you imagine uh, ten as a as a unit in which one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine are contained, th yeah. then within that you could repeat one seven times and and occur at the number seven. So that's one one expression of it. Uh, again, it's a convoluted it's a strange, way. I know it's a strange way to present it. <laughs> yes. Well, it's and what's the other? The other is the number outside of ten. So the number, the other way of uh, speaking of seven is the number outside of 10, the beginning of which is altogether the unit increasing according to a twofold or threefold or any other proportion whatsoever, as are the numbers. And then he gives the examples of 64, which is three to the power of six, uh, sorry, two to the power of six or 729, which is two to the power of six. 
um, the one number of which is increased by doubling on from the unit and the other by trebling. Or yeah, three to the power of three is the other way of saying uh, 27. Yeah. Uh, and, the other, and the other way is really funny. The order is a number outside 10, the beginning of which is all together, the unit increasing according to a twofold or threefold or any other proportion, whatever. Okay, uh, rather than to say two plus three plus two. But why doesn't he, why doesn't he say, since we're trying to get at the number seven, why doesn't he speak of it from the standpoint of like, to the power of seven, like two to the power of seven, three to the power of seven, which is all beyond 10. Wouldn't that get us more at the idea, another idea of seven outside of 10 being different from the first type, which is with contained within 10? But why does he use these other examples of powers of two, powers of three, of six? Is that exactly what he's doing? No. So you... no. Let, let's, re let's read the no. next paragraph. Okay. Let me read the next paragraph. 92. For in every case, the number which is combined from the unit in double or treble ratio, or any other ratio whatsoever, is the seventh number, a cube and a square, embracing both species, both that of the incorporeal and that of the corpor corporeal essence. That of the incorporeal essence, according to the superficies which quadrangular figures present, and that of the corporeal essence, according to the other figure which cubes make. Now, if somebody can explain that one. Hmm. Or in every case, the number of which is combined from the unit in double or triple ratio or any other ratio whatsoever is the seventh number. That is not 100% in my head. Um, no, mine either. Mine either. That's I understand the unit in double or treble ratio. I mean, the number six, for example, two threes, three twos. Yeah or any other ratio whatsoever is the seventh number. Now that 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 is just a little bit strange for me. Yeah. Mm. Why is it the seventh number? I see. I get it. I think no, maybe maybe well, I the don't. seventh number. What was it? What did you think, Matt? When it comes no. to geometry. Uh, go on. Yeah, go go on, up. Kelly. Yeah. Right, uh, trying to do um, a seven-sided figure, it's like it's almost impossible for the average person to comprehend that. Yeah. So maybe the maybe only, the, there's a similarity here. The only thing that I, I can suggest is, once again, is symbolic language, okay? Because I think the two major idea is the corporeal and the incorporeal essence. But why would he associate the cube with is a 3D figure with the corporeal essence and a surface which is a 2D uh, object with incorporeal essence? Okay, we would have, we would need to give an explanation to that. But I feel that the core concepts here is corporeal versus incorporeal, or if you want time and timelessness one again, once again. Yeah, it's a tough uh, paragraph that. Uh, yeah. 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 And it's like the, the number seven is the only number I can't see when I think of a square or a cube. You know, like I can think of the six faces of the cube, the eight vertices, the four sides of the square, the like I can think of a variety of number that would express itself in those oh. things. And yet the seven doesn't show up in my head. Yeah. Is it because it's an inversion? I don't know. Uh, and that's but... why he uses 10. And then he uses the Trinity, uh, which is yeah. Seeing, I, I, seeing... I think I think the ten is merely a basis for arithmetic. Yeah. Is is it because um, numbers so simply multiply earlier? We talked that? earlier about creation, right? And creation yeah. was six days, and then we yeah. added a seventh on. Is that yeah. what he's going back to? Is like everything is... sixes except there's also one more, and so it's yeah. seven. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And let's say let's not forget that uh, on the seventh day, uh, God was uh, was resting. Okay, so mm -hmm. he did not do anything. So he rests in timelessness. And for day one to day six, uh, he was manifesting in time. So 
I think here that, that there's no geome geometric uh, discovery to be done, but it's symbolic yeah. language. It's, mm. it's symbolic language. It's new, well, I'll, it's, I'll interject it's, here because I think I see some geometric meaning. Aha, oh, all right. So, <laughs> um, and here, I mean, we all agree that the language here is very convoluted. So uh, bear with me. I might be completely off the track. <laughs> but when I read the phrase uh, that begins with that of the incorporeal essence according to the superficies which quadrangular figures present, blah, 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 I'm reminded of the book um, Flatland, um, oh, yeah. which presents the idea. Well, it's, I mean, it's not the first book to present that idea, but basically it's answering the question or posing the question, how do you let's say, form a square. You basically have the, the bottom-up vision and the top-down vision. So the bottom-up vision would be that you get a line by putting together points, and then you get the square by putting side-by-side -side lines, right? Mm -hmm. And the other top-down vision of constructing the square is that to have a square, you must come from a higher dimension and um, drop down into a lower dimension by getting a cut of a cube, let's say. So if you have a cube that is uh, being, I don't know how to put it, but... Section. Uh, Section. Uh, uh, yeah, se uh, if you get a, a section of a cube, thanks, Juan, um, depending on how you cut it, of course, but if you cut it parallel to one of its base, you're going to get a square. Or you can just look at the face of a cube and you're going to get a square. Just like if you get a section of a sphere, you're going to get a circle. Mm -hmm. And so the idea now is that I'm taking the, the 2D shapes of the square because it's easier to understand. But then you can ask yourself, how do you get the cube? And that would be from a, a fourth dimensional object that, and the cube would be a section of that four dimension object. So when I read that of the incorporeal essence according to the superficies, which quadrangular figures present, and that of the corporeal essence, according to the other figure which cubes make, that's what it brings to my mind. But then again, the language here, and you know, English well, is my second language. Hmm. Uh, I might be half track here, but that's what it comes to my mind. Well, let's keep that next paragraph. Thank you for that, yeah. Kevin. That, that's yeah. that's a lot to chew on. But the next paragraph seems he's going to add more, I think, clues to our our search. I think he wants yep. us. He he would want us to do what we're doing though, and ponder yep. and hypothesize because that's the whole point. He's trying to, like all great pl Platonist writers, they're always trying to rev your mind to hypothesize what their intention is. They don't give you crystal finished literalist answers that would satisfy an, an Aristotelian. So it's good. I think Philo would be happy that we're doing this. So let's see if, if what he gives us next. I think the next paragraph makes a few things a little bit clearer. Okay. And the clearest proof of this is afforded by the numbers already spoken of. In the seventh number, increasing immediately from the unit in a twofold ratio, namely the number 64, is a square formed by the multiplication of eight by eight. And it is also a cube by the multiplication of four and four. There's the relationship between cube and square. Four times. And again, the seventh number from the unit being increased in a threefold ratio, that is to say, the number 729 is a square, the number 7 and 20 being multiplied by itself, and it is also a cube by 9 being multiplied by itself nine times. So there's a pattern there. And in yeah. every case, um, yeah, do you want to talk about that at all? No, it, it's it's fine, I think. But that's that's well, good. Yeah, there, there's three. There's different ways of looking at these numbers that are ones. Like we could think of the sixty four as a unit, like a an identity unto itself. But it also could be thought of as being two to the power of six, like two multiplied six times, or eight eight times to the power of two, eight times eight, or four to the power of three. In one case, it would give you a square figure if you were to express the the eight times eight right in a geometrical. You would get a square, but if you were to express the four. 
Um, geometrically, you would get a cube because four times four times four. All cases, so sixty four is not one thing, right? And if you were just to do it as a as a as a two to the power of six, I don't know what that would look like <laughs> geometrically, but uh, yeah. maybe it. But in the case of two, that would give you seven because it's like two times two times two times two times two times two. That's six six numbers of two. So you've got six uh, quantities. Action is happening to happening to the six, resulting in a in a seventh quantity as a result. That's the only place I see a seven directly entering into that that idea. Yeah, I'll go with that, Matthew. That makes as much sense as anything I can come up with. I'm just desperate sure. to find a seven. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean everything else, you know, the squares and the cubes and everything, and the numerical relationships and the patterns that are exhibited there, that all makes simple sense. But it's this seventh number, and I think your explanation is about as good as we're going to get Please. today, anyway. Hmm. Unless somebody wants to go back and scour everything that Buckminster Fuller wrote and comes up with a seven-sided object that we can all understand. So I, I missed uh, something. Oh wait. I missed something in the maybe the previous paragraphs. Um, how, how, why is he talking about not these numbers in the first place? Uh, what what sparked his imagination? I, I think I missed something. In all like, in all paragraphs, he's been looking at the quantization of existence. He was looking at astronomy, the planetary motions. He's been looking at all sorts of things. The days, the seasons, the as you know. All right, as, all right. So all, all all of this has been different ways of getting us to think about um the 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 reasoning behind the mind of the creator that we tap into by looking at our own reasoning in motion, trying to figure out the mind of the creator and and finding that there's things to hold on to along the way. Um, so he's just pondering basically what he knows of um, uh, numerology, for a better word. And, I wouldn't call um, it that. Let's let's not call it that because okay. he wouldn't want right. that. Well, hang on, yeah. folks. I mean, the whole of this writing is is expressed in terms of Genesis. Yes. Yeah. This is what is he, he's explaining. You know what happened on day one of creation. What happened on day two. Yeah. And what we're we're reading through now is his discussion of what happened when we get to day seven. It is his opinion, though. It's not necessarily yeah. no. It's not. It's not the gospel truth. But it's it's it, he's mean, he's looking at. Um, he's into something. Yeah, I mean, he's he's looking at the as you said, it's, it's creation, right? It's it's what what is the the why is creation not what is alone, but he's he's introducing the Platonic question of why, uh, what's a and what would be a reasonable hypothesis for the the big why questions that uh, a lot of people just don't know how to how to address. But I heard uh, Declan, you were about to say something. Well, yeah, I was thinking what you were saying about the numbers. And we go back to the seventh number. I think it has to do with our understanding of what ordinal numbers are, counting numbers. Mm -hmm. And so when you get to one, is that the first number or the second number? Uh -huh. If you think of zero being the first number, and then you count from there, you would, you would come to um, 64 being the seventh number if you're counting twos instead of ones yeah Ooh. that's inter Ooh. that's interesting but i would like to give hmm. i would like to propose a an objection because the zero did not exist as philo's time yeah it really didn't exist at philo's time was it really the indians yeah. who, who came up with yes zero? The, yeah. the, yes yes the indian hmm. invented the, the the zero five centuries after philo really and it has yes and it has only been used in mathematical calculation seven centuries after philo that's right too yeah and, and that was, uh, that and was a muslim philo, discovery yeah uh, no no the zero was an indian discovery and no muslim, no i mean the seven centuries later but oh, I, yes. I, I, I guess, and no, I don't want to, no, no. I don't want to derail no. this too much. But I, d wouldn't it have have occurred to somebody that look, I've got like eight mm -hmm. apples, and somebody stole my apples. Now I have no apples. Like that zero, nothing, that absence of what I used to have. Wouldn't that have yeah. occurred to somebody earlier to express that yes. in a in language? The, the Chinese, for example, a lot before Philo, use an empty space to symbolize zero. Okay, yeah. so an empty space. Is a representation for zero for the Chinese, but the zero, the round zero, has been invented by Brahma Gupta in the fifth yeah. century CE. Yes. Yeah. So, and the the 
Arabic speaking people wouldn't propagate that and Fibonacci wouldn't bring it to Europe in the 12th century. Hmm. What about yes. the concept of infinity? Would they know uh, that? Yes. Yes. But they did they did, did not use the eight, uh, the the recline eight for that before a long time. Okay. Well, let's let's keep her going. Okay. And in every case, a man making his beginning from the unit and proceeding on to the seventh number and increasing in the same ratio till he comes to the number seven will at all times find the number when increased both a cube and a square. At all events, he who begins with the number 64 and combines them in a doubling ratio will make the seventh number 4096, which is both a square and a cube, having 64 as its square root and 16 as its cube root. Now, that's interesting. That That's a real pattern, if that one's true. And we must also pass on to the other species of the number seven, which is contained in the number 10, and which displays an admirable nature, and one not inferior to the previously mentioned species. The number seven consists of one and two and four, numbers which have two most harmonious ratios, the twofold and the fourfold ratio, the former of which affects the diapason harmony, while the fourfold ratio causes that of the double diapason. And people don't know a diapason is a reference to vocal intonation. It also comprehends other divisions existing in some kind of yoke-like combination, for it is divided first of all into the number one and the number six, then into the two and the five, and last of all into the three and the four. Isn't the diapason? It's been a while since I used this I, I, this language, but isn't that an octave? No, no it's, the, it's a tuning fork. Yeah. Uh, look, in music, it's, it's it's often referred to as just simply the way in which a pitch will, you know, a vocal pitch will go up or down in a certain ratio. Oh, it's not. It, it doesn't refer to the ratio at all. It's a more general term. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a general dis description of all ratios. Yeah. Um. It's a long time since I studied Gregorian chant, but I seem to remember discussions about it in relation to that. Anyway. Oh, yeah, no, but, uh, it, but it is it is in Middle English, uh, the interval of an octave, right? But okay. that may, yeah. it may not be what he's referring to, though. Yeah. Or through all. In Greek, it means uh, diapason uh, through all notes. Right, that, that's how Kepler yeah, used yeah, the Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. An octave is all-encompassing. Yeah. Uh, let me think, let me think, let me think. Okay, and the proportion of these numbers is a most musical one, for the number six bears to the number one a six-fold ratio, and the six-fold ratio causes the greatest possible difference between existing tones, the distance, namely, by which the sharpest tone is separated from the flattest as we shall show when we pass on from numbers to the discussion of harmony. Again, the ratio of four to two displays the greatest power in harmony, almost equal to that of the diapason, as is most evidently shown in the rules of that art. And the ratio of four to three affects the first harmony, that in the thirds, which is the diatoseron. Right. The number seven displays also another beauty which it possesses, and one which is most sacred to think of. For as it consists of three and four, it displays in existing things a line which is free from all deviation and upright by nature. And in what way it does so, I must show. The rectangular triangle, which is the beginning of all qualities, consists of the numbers five. This discussion about numbers is not very intelligible, but here Philo is probably referring to the problem of Euclid on the subject of the square of the hypotenuse. Thus, if three and four represents the sides containing the angle and five the sides subtending it, we get three times three plus four times four equals nine plus 16 equals 25. Five times five equals 25. Okay, so let me just go back a bit. The rectangular triangle, which is the beginning of all qualities, consists of the numbers... Where are we? Where do we end up? Uh, five and four. Five oh. and four and five, and the three and four, which are the the essence of the seven, contain the right angle. Did you remove something from the script, then, Matthew? 
I get yeah, okay, because yeah, it's just yeah, the, okay, the it's just the the translator yeah, 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 sure. yeah, yeah, half fast okay, commentary. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, why I was tr- trying to find where I was. Never mind. Sorry. Consists of the numbers five and four, uh, and and four and five, and the three and the four, which are the essence of the seven, contain the right angle. For the obtuse angle and the acute angle show irregularity and disorder and inequality. For one may be more accurate or more obtuse than another, but a right angle does not admit of comparison. Nor is it one right angle more. Nor is one right angle more a right angle than another, but one remains similar to another never changing its peculiar nature. But if the right angle triangle is the beginning of all figures and of all qualities, and if the essence of the number seven, that is to say the numbers three and four together, supply the most necessary part of this, namely the right angle, then seven may be rightly thought to be the fountain of every figure and of every quality. And besides what has already been what has been already advanced, this also may be asserted that three is the number of a plane figure, since a point which has been laid down to be according to a unit, and a line according to the number two, and a plane superficies according to the number three. Also, four is the number of a cube by the addition of one to the number of a plane surfaces, depth being added to the superficies. From which it is plain that the essence of the number seven is the foundation of geometry and trigonometry, and in a word, of all incorporeal and corporeal substances. Yeah, but I want to add uh, number five too, because a three plus a four plus five equal twelve, and twelve represents the twelve months of the year. As well, right? <laughs> <And the> twelve <laughs> do, but, do we... but and that... so much more. <laughs> No, but that that is Gnostic Bible. <laughs> well, and, and twelve is one plus two, and one plus two is three, and three is three. <laughs> three is, yeah, exactly. Matthew, <laughs> that is very good. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're uh, being challenged here. Yeah, oh, yeah. There's, you know, look, we could go off at a huge tangent here once you bring the number twelve into it. For goodness' sake. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll be heading down some pretty obscure Kabbalistic territory there, Quan. So let's not go there, okay? No, no, no. But uh, the last paragraph you read uh, is perfectly clear. At least it's about uh, the number seven, yeah. Yes, the number seven and the beauty of the right angle triangle and of the uh, Pythagorean theorem. At least we are in solid terrain here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well. Okay, continuing. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. So for the last thing, uh, when you were reading the um, the the last paragraph, you just said that uh, he was describing the Pythagorean uh, triangle of the the right angle triangle. Yeah. Um, featuring what what lengths was he saying here? Uh, four is the length yeah. of four and three. Wait. Four and three, yeah. Yeah. And and one, I suppose, the uh, is the last one. Four and no, three. No, no. It's three, four, five. Oh, it, no, no, three. Also, four three. is the number of a cube by the addition of one to the number of a plane superficies, depth being added to the superficies, from which it is plain that the essence of the number seven is the foundation of geometry and trigonometry, and in a word, of all incorporeal and corporeal substances. Mm. Uh, here I am. Uh, I understand his enthusiasm for the Pythagorean theorem, but uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, of an not far fetched, but uh, extra excitement here. Could I read something to you? Yeah, sure, Marie. Okay. Um, this is um, in a sacred geometry book. Um, if we recall the basic archetypes of the zodiac and the planets as expressed in the macrocosm, we observe the role of the number three and four. Three is the descending, expanding, and ascending of the spiritual light as source, and four is the cardinal qualities of heat, moistness, dryness, and cold. These two archetypal numbers are united in the geometrical figure and prime solid, the tetrahedron. This figure has four triangular faces and has four triangular faces and four nodes. This is traditionally associated with Plato as the first member of the four regular solid figures known as the Platonic solids. In fact, it is 
well to remember that Plato was in fact recording an oral tradition, the dialogues, and even though the figures can be deduced from his obscure transcriptions in the Timaeus, he was obviously guarded as to how much he revealed of the mathematical knowledge of the Pythagorean tradition. What were you reading from? Um, it's He's a very famous scholar. Um, his name is Keith Critchlaw. Hmm. And um, he works off and on with another famous scholar taught at Georgetown. I think he's probably retired now. Sayed Hossein Nasser. Um, I think Critchlaw was actually, this could be a rumor, but I heard it uh, a number of years ago. He may have actually been the tutor uh, to Prince Charles's two kids. I don't know how much good that did, but in any case, yes. um, uh, I don't think he was the tutor to Charles. I think he was the tutor to his kids. And Critchlaw died at least 15 years ago. Um, but he set up a school for sacred geometry in London. Um, oh. So anyway, and when, and when he taught there, it was excellent. I mean, by the time I mm. got there, it was like pretty mediocre. But Cr Critchlaw oh, you was... you you studied at this this school for sacred yeah. geometry. Yeah, I did. Were you um, were you like really young and out of high school or? Something? Oh no, I was older and discovered it way late in life. So it had started, you know, when when I got there, I was studying with people who studied under Critchlaw, and they, I mean, there was a world of difference. So Critchlaw really knew his stuff. The other people were just. Do me a favor know, and uh, send me a link to the that school. I'd like to look into this London Sacred Geometry School tied to the royal family a bit more. Okay, um, it's a one of Ch uh, Prince Charles's charities. It's called the Prince's School. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah Prince Charles might be good after all. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's the punchline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great punchline. Um, so anyway, I mean, people say you know he goes shows up to the yearly exhibit of the stuff. They don't just do sacred geometry. They used to do a lot more of it when Critchlaw was there. And Nasser is an excellent scholar. I would certainly um, recommend any almost anything he's written. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, and Critchlaw is great. If you can get anything Critchlaw's written, he's fantastic. I'll definitely be looking into this. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, where were we? Ninety nine. Uh, sure. And such great sanctity is there in the number seven that it has a preeminent rank beyond all the other numbers in the first decade. For of the other numbers, some produce without being produced. Others are produced but have no productive power themselves. Others, again, both produce and are produced. But the number seven alone is contemplated in no part. And this proposition we must confirm by demonstration. Now, the number one produces all the other numbers in order, being itself produced absolutely by no other. And the number eight is produced by twice four, but itself produces no other number in the decade. Again, four has the rank of both, that is, of parents and of offspring, for it produces eight when double and is produced by twice two. But seven alone, as I said, neither produces nor is produced, prime number on which account other philosophers, philosophers liken this number to victory, who had no mother, and to the virgin goddess, whom the fable asserts to have sprung from the head of Jupiter. And the Pythagoreans compare it to the ruler of all things, for that which neither produces nor is produced remains immovable. For generation consists in motion, since that which is generated cannot be so without motion, both to cause production and to be produced. And the only thing which neither moves nor is moved is the elder, ruler, and lord of the universe, of whom the number seven may reasonably be called a likeness. Hmm. And Philolaus gives his testimony to this doctrine of mine in the following words. For God, says he, is the ruler and lord of all things, being one, eternal, lasting, immovable, himself like to himself, and different from all other beings. Hmm. That's nice. Yeah, and it's not that it's it's seven is is simply that it's a prime number, but it's that it's it's specifically a prime number because so is two and and three and five, but it, it's one that has this peculiar quality, right? Where it can't have anything added 
uh to make another number it's it's or or taken away from to yeah as a unit it uh it's sufficient unto itself whereas like three times three still gives you nine two times two still gives you four as a squ as square numbers but seven doesn't within the within the realm of of ten the boundary yeah. the boundedness of ten the boundary of ten yeah yeah that's why yes, the, the earlier numbers all do with uh, anyway yeah. hmm among well, the five, things which well hold up hold that thought. five is a peculiar number as well isn't it like it it's not really mentioned here no it's true it is a peculiar number um I don't know. I don't know. I think well, there's a lot a that we're not string. going to understand from this one. Well, I guess because you could you could add five to itself, and you still get ten. Because if yeah, the I boundary don't know, condition no, is that's... ten. Yeah. Hmm. Well, personally, I mean, could you I... make the same argument with six? Yeah, you get twelve, so you're beyond ten already. I mean, exactly. Well, that's the thing. Like you, you can you. It's number babbling, like yeah. Juan mm -hmm. said. I mean, mm -hmm. as for the number five, uh, if you think of the Platonic solids, uh, we know that uh, they can all be formed with uh, faces that have a maximum of five vertices, right? Um, is it vertices or what's the? Anyway, uh, like a, a faces with five sides, right? Uh, so, but I mean, you can go on and on and on and on with these kind of things. So, I think we shouldn't dwell too much. No, it's true. Kind of yeah. It's true. Yeah. Well, it's a symbolic system. Okay. Yeah. Because why 10 would be the boundary of that system? We can elaborate very long on the value of 10. But uh, it's a symbolic system, and all symbolic systems have uh, definitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to just to add a little more, I mean, you know, the uh, I, I put a comment in the chat uh, about the, the seventh number, but just to chime in a little bit on that, I mean, there's some philosophical um, thoughts that are pretty good that you can get out of those things, like you you basically you cannot create something out of nothing meaning you cannot start from zero and get the other numbers out of the zero you must start from the unit hence why we have to start from one to get the two and then the four and then so on you know so there is some value in those kind of things i think but um <laughs> if you dwell too much on it you you uh, you get lost in the nonsense, I think. Yep. Yeah, I, yeah. I would like to remind a historical incident. One of the disciples of Pythagoras said that there are numbers which are not rational, meaning which cannot be exactly. expressed express as a ratio of two integers. And he has been thrown into the sea. So, you know, sometimes... <laughs> Apparently, rational people behave very irrationally. <laughs> just like yeah. just like numbers, yes. Yeah, and, the, and there's a good point in there because you know the the, the Pythagoreans were uh, trapped in their uh, thinking about numbers. You know, for them, the square root of two was a monster. Like like you said, Quan, this guy was dropped into the sea because of that. But because they were so enclosed into their thinking, they weren't able to expand their understanding of numbers outside of the rational numbers. Yeah, they forget goodness, okay? Mm -hmm. In the sense that it's not because one of your disciple discovers something that uh, make you angry that you should throw him into the sea. So <laughs> I would say that those uh, intellectual speculation always have to be under the supervision of beauty, goodness, and truth. Yeah, I would also just, caution that um the majority of the authoritative anal or opinions that we have about the pythagoreans came from an anti-pythagorean in the form of aristotle who did yep. the most mm -hmm. to convey the popular idea of them which even kepler was thinking about when he was criticizing the pythagoreans as believing everything is reducible to numbers so i don't know 
I don't know. Maybe, maybe that, maybe they were more into goodness, and that's been uh, obscured after they were all massacred. Okay. Yeah, it it was Matt uh, three seconds to uphold Pythagorean uh, thinking, <laughs> and they were not mad that they were they have been slandered. Maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist, so that's, yeah. how, that's how I roll. You're not, you're not you're not the only one, Matthew. Plenty of people have written along those lines. Yeah, but I, I've got a uh, an early morning RT thing, so I'm gonna for, unfortunately 10 10 p.m. was my my cutoff, and I love our our longer conversations after these these readings, but tonight I can't do it. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, guys. This, this, this one would go on forever and probably get nowhere. No, I'm sure we'd get somewhere. Maybe not where we, we want to be, but we, we'd get further yeah, but than we were when we started. Get, yeah, yeah, which is which is <laughs> the whole purpose of it. Yeah.